But my mom and dad had no like idea or clue around anything mental health. And so with that being said, like my dad would always, you know, they would talk that, oh, this is just a white person's problem, that's it. And so in that, that really started to stick with me from an identity standpoint of like, oh, well, I'm not supposed to be dealing with this, something must be wrong with me. And so what ended up transpiring though was that one day my bullies jumped me in the bathroom during like the sixth grade year. And from there, I found myself going home with this idea of like, I need to change something about my physical appearance. And so I just want to give a quick trigger warning within this. But I went home that day and I had this thought where I said, what if I could cut some of the fat off my body? From that, it turned into what we would uh, acknowledge as um, self-mutilation for uh, a year or so. And then after that, they became attempted suicides. Like it's, it turned into cutting and then it just it transformed into something different. Crazy enough, two years had passed. I got to high school, became a standout quarterback in the sport of football, started getting scholarship offers galore throughout the country. And I thought the NFL was going to be my ticket out. And so when that didn't happen because senior year i found myself taking a hit on the field they found out that i had a heart murmur the depression and the suicide attempts really just like amped up i got to college and in the span of 18 months my life spiraled out of control completely i went from 100, 200 pounds to 370 pounds i was failing in school and then um, i ended up getting into a relationship where i became the victim of domestic abuse and for a long time i just felt like this is all I was ever good enough to have and deserve. And so in that, that was my mind frame. Dr. King Day of 2008, um, I essentially, I was kind of at my wits end with everything. I had an argument with the young lady I was with at the time, and it just like completely, it, that was a switch that flipped inside of me. And I said, well, if you don't care about me and nobody else cares about me, why do I care about myself? And in that moment, I had my final attempt. So I'm an author of seven books. My third book is called Love Between My Scars. And this is actually from my final attempt, right? This idea of finding love and pain, finding love within these scars. And so that final attempt was actually the uptick and the transformation for me. I got to the hospital. The doctor told me I tapped the main vessel at the top of my wrist, but no blood would come out. His next words to me were, Mr. Taylor, you got a purpose in life and you need to figure out what it is. Little did he know that purpose was the very thing that I had struggled with for so long. And so in that, it started this journey of community, people coming around me because I was very well known around my college campus from being active in a multitude of activities and groups. And so the outpour of love, going to therapy for the first time. So fighting off all of the stigmas because I'm a professional singer too and I grew up in the church. And so it was like, oh, you're not praying hard enough. You're not close enough to God. My grandfather is the son of slaves from Possum Trot, Mississippi. And in that, it was like, oh, your ancestors dealt with worse. So you don't, you, you ain't got nothing to be sad about, right? We can talk about how from the, I fought that whole like, oh, if I go to therapy, like, and tell them about this white person's problem, then what, right? Yeah, that was beautiful. Uh, just listening to you, uh, Richard, so many things came to mind. You know, um, at the risk of repeating myself, I, I share a lot of parallels here with Richard. So in terms of my um, encounters with mental health related challenges, it happened when I was 39 years old. I'm 44 years old today. So I was in Seattle. Um, so just a quick background on me. I'm, I'm born and brought up in India. I came to the US to pursue my graduate studies, landed here in Seattle about 22 years ago got my degree from UW and you know I became a working professional and started checking off those boxes right that I was supposed to check off um, any anyways in uh, yeah so I've been working a lot on my own journey in terms of what does it mean to be a man today because I had a lot of confusion about that myself especially in my late 20s as I was coming upon a transition point I was finishing my school trying to decide what am I going to do with my life. And so there's a lot of confusion, which is natural for most people. But for me, the, beyond that, the confusion was, what the hell am I supposed to do as a man? You know, I met the woman that I loved, she was now my wife. How do I be a husband? What is, you know, because I had no role models, unfortunately, positive role models growing up back in India. So I was really hungry. I was hungry to learn. And that's what brought me to this amazing organization so it's called the mankind project they've been around for almost 40 years and that's when uh, in my i think i was 30 years old is when i really started to d dive deeper into what it means to be a mature masculine you know not the stereotypical images that are portrayed in us in our communities and societies
So anyways, I was, I was uncovering a lot of stuff. I was working on my childhood trauma, on all my wounding that happened as a part of my upbringing. And something happened when I was coming to my 40s. Uh, and I know we say, you know, typically that's kind of the midlife crisis point, but not just for men. I mean, I, I know women experience this too. But I, was, I began to question, much like Richard here, why the hell am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Am I living the life that I was meant to live? Or am I just pleasing other people? Major depressive disorder, uh, coupled with severe anxiety. Um, then I had also some experiences with auditory hallucinations, uh, suicidal ideations, because I just felt like, what's the point of me even living? The world would be better off with me without in it. You know, so the complete lack of self-worth. Um, and for me, you know, I, I know Richard talked about the, that, that, that pivotal moment. For me, in, in a beautiful way, the pivotal moment was actually uh, my cat, our cat. We had to put him down um, in, in a couple of months after I was going, you know, I was going on through my recovery, medications, therapy, all that stuff. And we had to make that hard decision to put him down due to old age. And I remember going to the wet and, you know, they gave him that sedating injection, right, which is not the, the, the final, like doesn't stop the heartbeat. But then, and, and I, I took him on my lap and I saw his body on my lap. And that was the first time in about three months that I just started bawling like a little boy. And I had not cried because I, I almost numbed my, uh, numbed out, you know. And I saw his body and there was this Im image in my mind, this is what I wanted to do to myself. So I had this image of my own dead body, you know, just lying down. And it was this magical thing where, you know, in his moment of death, my cat Mitsu, he gave me the gift of life. And that's what I truly and honestly believe. I can't explain it in words, but that was the day things shifted for me. And I said, never again am I gonna, um, you know, uh, even think about ending my life because this is a gift that has been given to me, right? And it's up to me uh, what to make of it. So since then, you know, I had another encounter in 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, 2020 when the pandemic started, but now much like Richard, my mission in life as a man is to really be an advocate for mental health, which is why I'm here today, because I want to break down the stigma, particularly in the South Asian culture that I belong to, uh, even going to a therapist, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, are you so weak that you can't figure this out by yourself, right? So that stigma very much persists. And the only way I can help the, the, the situation is to speak my own truth. Right? and not be ashamed of speaking that truth and just coming out in community events and, and you know doing the best that I can. So for folks that aren't in therapy, that aren't, that aren't engaged in that work yet, what are some things that we can do for ourselves and each other to try to work on our mental health outside the therapeutic process and our daily work and life life? Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, again with that idea of community. Like where, is the safe place for you to reach out and to explore your internal world. Uh, and that's a really risky thing if you're struggling. It's finding someone that you can say, hey, I need to talk. It's hard. I'm not having a great week. Uh, you said, can we have real talk? Yeah, you need to have that place, right? So that's a great starting point. Uh, and then Avi really, uh, he brought up a great point earlier, and, and um, Richard as well. We all ended up in our conversation before we got in here. Uh, we all some way touched on the value of nature, of the earth, to connect us, to ground us, to find ourselves. Um, so having some sort of practice where you're connecting to the earth um, and, and to people is going to be really powerful if you're, if you're looking for a starting place to connect with yourself and your mental health uh, and, and how you want to address that. So.